This Capital Ministries Bible study from President and Founder Ralph Drawlinger is entitled, Is the Entire New Testament Inspired by God? Our Introduction There are several ways this question can be answered by the use of Scripture and the testimony of church history, as we will see. Keep in mind that the outcome of the study is extremely important relative to our formation of convictions regarding the Bible. In other words, if you side with the idea that only Jesus' words need be studied, then one need not interest themselves in the writings of the apostles and all that they instruct about the Christian life. Often what Jesus mentions, the apostles spell out in detail. This includes matters such as the believer's active commitment to a Bible-teaching local church, steadfastness towards missions, evangelism, and discipleship, growing in knowledge and understanding of the Word, among other important issues. Accordingly, the purpose of our time together in God's Word this week is to build your passion regarding the inspiration and authority of the whole of the New Testament's 27 books. Holding to or rejecting this conviction will drastically impact your life. When Paul said to the Ephesian elders whom he had ministered to for over three years, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God, Acts 20.17, he knew how spiritually thwarting and damaging it was to starve a believer from the spiritual food they so desperately need from the Bible. Every Christian needs a consistent diet of Scripture. We need to know what it says regarding creation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. This is why the primary role of any pastor is to teach, 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 and teach the Word of God. Cross-reference Ephesians 4.11 As you study the priority of the pastor-teacher's job description, throughout the Scriptures there is clearly an emphasis on Bible instruction. Here then are three reasons why one can trust in the plenary inspiration of all 27 New Testament books. The Testimony of the Authors If the whole of the New Testament is to be taken as the authoritative, infallible, inerrant, plenary-inspired oracle of God, in addition to the Old Testament, then it would follow that the writers whom God spoke through would testify to their being used in that way. They did. Here are several examples. The Apostle Paul. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. 1 Corinthians 14.37, cross-reference, 1 Corinthians 2.13.16, and 2 Corinthians 2.17. The Apostle John. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Revelations 1, 1 through 2, cross-reference Revelation 1, 10 through 11, 21, 5, chapter 22, verse 6, 22, 18, and 19. The Apostle Peter. These things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Jesus, not in question, but included. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is, what will judge him at the last day? John 12, 48. Peter testifies of Paul. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures, to their own destruction. 2 Peter three fifteen through 16 Paul testifies of Peter. For this reason we also constantly thank God, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, 
but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Jude testifies of the apostles. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers, following after their own ungodly lusts. Jude 17 through 18. In a broader sense, both Paul and Peter attest to the total inspiration of Scripture in their letters. Here are several passages. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It is worth noting that liberal theologians interpret this important passage incorrectly. Misquoting Scripture, they teach, All Scripture inspired by God is, which leaves open the possibility that some Scripture is not inspired by God implying that it is incumbent upon man to figure out what is and what is not. However, similarly constructed passages in the Greek New Testament, Romans 7.12, 2 Corinthians 10.10, 1 Timothy 1.15, 2.2-4.4, as well as Hebrews 4, verse 17, indicate very convincingly that, from a grammatical perspective, Such a translation is impossible. All Scripture is inspired, is the proper translation. Peter adds in 2 Peter 1, 20-21, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What inspiration really means? Number one, it does not mean that writers were inspired. Specifically, it's not the writers, it's the scriptures that are given by inspiration of God. It is all scripture, graphe, that is inspired, theonoustos, or God-breathed. When speaking and scripting apart from the penning of scripture, the writers of the New Testament were human and subject to fallibility and inaccuracy. 2. God worked in unison with the writer's mind. Sometimes God dictated through them, Jeremiah 1, 9, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. But most often, he utilized the personality of his prophet or apostle. Note the following quote. But as clearly seen in Scripture itself, God's divine truth more often flowed through the minds, souls, hearts, and emotions of his chosen human instruments. Yet by whatever means, God divinely superintended the accurate recording of his divinely breathed truth by his divinely chosen men. In a supernatural way, he has provided his divine word in human words that any person, even a child, can be led by his Holy Spirit to understand sufficiently to be saved. 3. Only the original autographa were inspired. However, the fact that none of the original manuscripts are in existence today does not pose a problem. Copying scribes could and did err. The New Testament scholar is not significantly hampered by the unavailability of the autographa. However, because of the science and art of textual criticism, the abundance of manuscripts of the New Testament or portions thereof, and the earliness of their dates in relation to the original compositions places him in a better position to know precisely what was originally written than for any other ancient writing. It is also important to comment on this quote of 2 Peter 3, 15-16. Since this is such a strong and straightforward passage, of the Apostle Peter attesting to the Apostle Paul's writing of Scripture, again, graphe, many liberal theologians in their biased desperation have attempted to discount the Epistle's authority by questioning its authorship by Peter and by vastly pushing back the date of its writing. However, the 20th century attempt to diminish the book runs cross-grain to 2 Peter's inclusion by the leaders of the 2nd century church 
with the other 26 New Testament books, the testimony of the second century church. The last book of the New Testament to be written was the Apocalypse, or as we better know it today, the book of Revelation. It was written by the Apostle John around A.D. 94 through 96. Thus, the era of the first century church came to a close, and the writing of the New Testament was completed. Many of the New Testament books were known as encyclicals, meaning they were intended for more than one audience to read. Some of the 27 books would become encyclicals as the various papyrus manuscripts that contained the New Testament books were passed around and recopied as they circulated from church to church during this period. Importantly, they were immediately viewed as authoritative because in addition to Christ's words, the apostles had always been seen as Christ's representatives, having been appointed by him. There was never any reason for the second century church to doubt that the apostles were Christ's spokesmen after the ascension and the day of Pentecost. Accordingly, their writings, given their own testimonies, were henceforth viewed and accepted as authoritative. There was never any doubt. This fact is further and convincingly witnessed in that the apostles' writings contained commands in them to be read in the church services in that the early church patterned their services after those of the Jewish synagogues, where the reading of Scripture was preeminent. This internal demand by the apostles to have their writings read alongside of them communicated a huge message relative to what we're studying. It is the apostles saying that their writings were equally Scripture. Note the following passages. Colossians 4.16 When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea, Ephesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. Revelation 1.3 Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 is in need of elaboration. The Greek word for adjure and orkizo means to put under an oath. It is very strong language and is indicative of Paul's intent. Paul put the church at Thessalonica under oath by God to read his letter to them and in the main service. It stands to reason If you were commanded by God to write Scripture, you would possess a similarly authoritative vocabulary. The fact that all of these verses explicitly say to read the apostolic writings in the church services is akin to placing them on par with Old Testament Scripture. Therefore, these passages more than suggest a foreseeable implication. By the middle of the second century, the authority of the apostles was accepted as equal to that of the Old Testament. Apostolic writings were read in church services along with those of the Old Testament. By the end of the period, the principle of a fixed and written New Testament canon was established. By the end of the second century, the classification of the New Testament writings as scriptural is evident in the apologetic writings of Arrhenius. Arrhenius was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. Arrhenius wrote to defend the faith from heretical teachings in his compendium of books titled Against All Heresies. In his treatment, he quotes 21 of the 27 New Testament books as his authority in refuting doctrinal errors. And his New Testament quotes far outweigh his use of the Old Testament. As of yet, the 27 New Testament books have still not been formally sewn together in what is referred to as the canonization of Scripture. What is especially important about the aforementioned is the acceptance and adherence of the second century church leaders and believers to the scriptural authority of the apostolic writers. Looking back, they could see the bakery through the binoculars. The second century church had a much greater vantage point than do we. 
The recent to apostolic authorship and scriptural authority carries much more sway than the present-day deviations of wayward liberal theologians, commenting some 2,000 years later. In comparison, their attempts to superimpose personal ideas on apostolic authority are almost laughable. The Testimony of the Canonizing Process The canonization of Scripture did not occur until the early 4th century. From A.D. 200 to 300, everyone in the Church knew of the basic contents of the New Testament and continued to view them as authoritative, although precise limits had not yet been defined. Prior to discussing the actual formalizing of the canon, it is essential to point out what the word means. Canon is from the same basic Greek word, In other words, it is transliterated from Greek into English. Its etymology stems from meaning a reed to a rod or bar. And since those are devices used for measuring, the word took on the metaphorical meaning of a standard. Used in literature, it meant a list of words correctly attributed to an author. Used in English, it means the authoritative books accepted as Holy Scripture. In a proper sense, the canon actually came into existence when the original penning of the autographa occurred, even though it took the Church many years to recognize that. In other words, the authority is latent in the books themselves, not the body that later canonized them. Importantly, the canon consists of those God-inspired books when penned by God's agents. Although much more could be said historically about the authenticating events that led up to the official recognition of the canon of the New Testament and more of the authenticating aspects of the 3rd century, for the sake of brevity, we will cut to the chase. Diocletian was the Roman emperor during the turn to the 4th century. He was a vicious man who ordered all religious books be burned in his attempt to have everyone worship him as God. The risk in hiding a copy of Scripture was personal death. One person who lived through the ordeal was Eusebius of Caesarea, A.D. 270-340. He was a respected church leader and historian and spent a great amount of time and attention to the canon. The future of the Scriptures was at stake. In his book, Church History, he speaks much about the subject of the canon. In 313, Constantine conquered the Roman Empire and declared Christianity as a legal religion. Soon thereafter, he commissioned Eusebius to make him 50 copies of the New Testament. Eusebius followed through, and this led to the actual sewing together of the books of the New Testament. Until this time, the New Testament existed in various codices, and the criteria for determining which books would actually be in the canon had not been solidified. Eusebius may be credited with achieving that amongst the church leaders. Athanasius then completed Eusebius' work. Therein the extent of the New Testament is codified and ratified by the Church Council of Laodicea in A.D. 365. The pronouncement of this gathering read, Psalms composed by private men must not be read in the church, nor books not admitted into the canon, but only the canonical books of the New and Old Testaments. Following this gathering was further ratification by church leaders throughout the world, and in two subsequent church leader councils, the canon was further verified and ratified. The second councils were the Council of Hippo in A.D. 393 and the Council of Carthage in A.D. 397. It is in this latter council that Augustine said, It is decreed that nothing except the canonical scriptures be read in the church under the name of divine scripture. Of the New Testament, the four Gospels, Acts, 13 epistles of St. Paul, the epistle of the same to the Hebrews, Peter 2, John 3, James, Jude, Apocalypse, states Westcott. General accord with this decision was evidenced in the practice of all the churches from that point on. The New Testament was now canonized. The latently authoritative writings 
had been recognized as such, collected and bound. The church had assented unanimously, recognizing them for what they had always been from their point of origin, God's oracles. Our summary. To say that the only words of Jesus in the book of Mark are worth reading is to starkly and blindly obliterate the testimony of the New Testament writers, the testimony of the third century church, and the testimony of the canonizing process. It is to commit intellectual sin, to side with liberal theologians, and it surely leads to an immature Christianity, if not heresy, in your own life. This spiritual immaturity is clearly seen in Markan adherents. They are characterized by thwarted personal growth in Christ and all that he expects of his called out ones in terms of a high view of the local church, evangelism, discipleship, missions, stewardship, and the like. One can certainly question if those who follow a Mark-only theology are truly Christians or saved, for they have gone so far as to redefine who Jesus Christ is. Theirs is not the Jesus of the whole Scripture. Are the Christian leaders you follow, including the pastor of your local church, in compliance with Paul's conviction? Acts 20, verse 27, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. This concludes our Bible study for this week. May God bless you deeply. Thank you for all you do in our great country and on the hill. This is Frank Sontag.